I have written JVM in Rust. Andre, you son of a bitch, I'm in. All right, lately I've been spending quite a bit of time learning Rust, and as any sane person would do after writing a few hundred lines of programs, or a few hundred lines programs, I've decided to take on something a little bit more ambitious. I have written a Java virtual machine in Rust. Yeah! With a lot of originality, and called it RJVM. The code is available on GitHub. Oh, dear. Oh, oh, yes. Oh, yes. Oh, I want all of this. I want to stress that this is my toy JVM, built for learning uh, purposes and not serious implementation. In particular, it does not support generics, threads, reflections, annotations, IO, just-in-time compiler, string and turning. <laughs> Still pretty good. Okay. Still pretty good. However, there are quite a few non-trivial things to implement. Control flow statements. Yep. Uh, primitive and object creations. A virtual and static method invocation. Exceptions. Garbage collection. Class resolution from a jar file. This last one is insane. Effing jar files. Effing class resolution. Effing Java. For example, the following uh, is part of a test suite. Class. Stack trace printing. Public static void main. All right. Throwable. New exception. Stack elements, get all these ones. Okay, print all these things. Okay, yeah, print step. Okay. It uses a real rt.jar containing the class from OpenJDK7. Thus, in the example above, the Java Lang stack trace element comes from the real JDK. I'm very happy. Oh, my goodness. I'm very happy with what I've learned about Rust and about how to implement a virtual machine. In particular, I'm super happy about having implemented a real working garbage collector. It's quite mediocre, but it's mine, and I love it. I love this mentality. By the way, this guy is just a champ. Andre, champ status right here. Given that I have achieved what I have set out to do originally, I've decided to stop the project here. I know there are bugs, but I do not plan to fix them. <laughs> love it. I love everything I'm hearing about. I love everything here. In this post, I will give you an overview of how my JVM works. In further articles, I will go into more detail about some of the aspects discussed here. Okay, code organization. Uh, the code is a standard Rust project I've split into three crates. A reader, which reads the doc class files. Okay. Uh, VM, which contains the virtual machine that can execute code as a library. Nice. And VimCle, which contains the very simple command line launcher for the uh, to run the VM. In the spirit of Java, executable. Okay, good. I'm considering extracting the reader crate in a separate repository and publishing it on crates.io, since it could actually be useful to someone else. Yeah, it could be. Parsing a class file. Interesting. As you know, Java's compiled language. The Java C compile uh, takes your .java source and produces uh, various .class files. Uh, generally distributed in a .jar file, which is just a zip. Oh, really? Jar is just zip? I thought I knew that. I feel like I knew that. Thus, the first thing to do is execute uh, some Java code is to load the doc class file containing the bytecode generated by the compiler. A class file contains the various things. Metadata uh, about the class, such as its name or the source file name. The super class name. What the hell is a super class name? I know what a super class is. Shh. Uh, and the implementing interfaces, the implemented interfaces, the fields along with their types and annotations, methods with their descriptor, which is a string representing the type of each parameter and the methods return, metadata such as the throw clauses, annotations, generic information, the bytecode along with some extra metadata such as exception handler table and the line numbers table. As mentioned above, for RJVM, I have created a separate crate named reader, which can parse the class file and return a Rust struct. Uh, that models the class and all of its content. Let's look at that struct really quickly. Look at that. Look at that. Look at that beauty. Oh, yeah. Nice job using format. Nice job. I like it. Oh, this is great. This is great. Uh, maybe toss in like an into. I think an into could be pretty cool right here. So that way you could take like maybe a path buff and just call into and you could just into. I, lo I love those kind of things personally. It makes me feel pretty happy. You know what I mean? Have you, ever had, have you ever done those? They always make me really happy uh, in twos. I don't know why. This is good. Well done. Well done. Beautiful. Uh, pretty code. Uh, pretty, co pretty code. All right. Executing methods. The main API of the VM crate is VM invoke, which is used to execute a method. It takes a call stack, which contains the various call frame, one for each method being executed. For executing main, the call stack will initially be empty and a new frame will be created to run it. Okay. Then each function invocation will add a new frame to the call stack. Okay, cool. When a method's execution completes, its corresponding frame will be dropped and then removed from the call stack. Awesome. 
Uh, most methods will be implemented in Java, and thus their bytecode will be executed. However, our JVM also supports native methods, i.e. methods that are implemented directly by the JVM and not in the Java bytecode. Oh, there's quite a few of them in the lower parts of the Java API, where the interaction of the operating system, for example, to do I.O., or the support runtime if ne or is necessary. Uh, some examples of, let's see, of the latter you might have seen included in this. Okay, this makes sense. Array copy. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, that all makes sense. These are implemented by the Rust uh, by Rust functions. Oh, cool. Okay, cool. This is actually really interesting. Uh, the JVM is a stack-based virtual machine, i.e. the bytecode instructions operate mainly on value stack. There is also a set of local variables identified by index that can be used to store values and pass arguments to methods. These are associated with each call frame. Okay, that makes sense. You have all your variables, all the information you need per call frame to do this. Okay. Modeling values and objects. The value of models and possibly value of the local variable stack element or object fields is also implemented as follows. Uh, we got a nice enum value, uninitialized. Uh, I love the named, I love these, all named. Abstract object, nice. Null. Classic effing null. Nice. If you look here, we have uninitialized and we have null. It's almost like we have undefined and null. This is fantastic. Okay, but it should never be on there. Okay, I see that. How long can I use this in Microsoft? Soon. Soon you'll be able to finally run Rust with JVM. Everybody's favorite thing ever. As an aside, this is one place where uh, a subtype, such as Rust enum, is a wonderful abstraction. It is great for expressing the fact that a value might be of multiple different types. Absolutely. Heterogeneous lists are just like so common in programming, I'm shocked that we still use what we use today. For storing objects and their values, I initially used a simple struct object containing a reference to the class, the object, or the model, uh, to model the object's type, and a vec value for storing the field. However, when I implemented the garbage collector, I modified this to use lower level implementation with a ton of pointers and casts quite C style. In the current implementation, an abstract object which models a real object or an array is simply a pointer to an array of bytes, which contains a couple headers, words, and then the field values. Beautiful! Oh, I love this! Oh, that's fantastic. That's kind of similar to how JavaScript core used to do it. I'm not sure what they do now, but there was something very, very similar to this, right? It's just like, a, in the end, it's just like a little array buffer underneath the hood in which you put a bunch of stuff into and you just offset into it to read these fields, right? That's all it really is in the end. Is this Rust script? No, this is Java in Rust. Uh, you gotta do, you gotta have Java but instead of having the a, a different runtime, you have you have a Rust runtime. So why would you want that? Well, it's written in Rust, primary feature, okay? Executing instructions. Executing a method means executing its bytecode instructions one at a time. The JVM has a wide list of instructions, over 200 encoded uh, by one byte in the bytecode. Many instructions are followed by arguments, and some have the variable length. This is modeled in the code uh, type of instruction. Okay, standard stuff, right? That makes all sense. Uh, you just have all these instructions come in. Each thing has to do something. It's just a big, I mean, it's just a loop with a switch in it, effectively. Uh, the execution of the method will keep, as mentioned above, a stack and an array of local variables referred by the instruction via their index. It will also initialize a program counter to zero. That is the address of the next instruction to execute. The instruction will be processed and the program counter updated. Okay, beautiful. This is awesome. Generally advanced by one. Uh, and various jump instructions can move to different locations. I remember, if you, did, if you did Advent of Code, I think it was like 2019, maybe? And 2019... Um, 2019 did this exact thing, right? Where uh, in Advent of Code, where you did like an int, int computer. You built like a really sweet int computer. Okay, everyone is saying there's something amazing. How to get sued by Oracle and the Rust Foundation at the same time. This is a great name. I will consider it. How to get sued by Oracle and the Rust Foundation at the same time. This is beautiful. Um, a special family of instructions uh, is made of those that can invoke another method. There are various ways of resolving which method should be invoked. Virtual or static lookup uh, are the main ones, but there are others. After resolving the correct instructions, RJVM will add a new frame to the call stack and start the method's execution. The method's return value will be pushed onto the uh, stack unless the, uh, it is void. Yep. Okay. So if you're not familiar with the call frame, this sounds like just like what a call frame would do. You have to make memory for both the return value and the return uh, address, all that kind of stuff. The Java bytecode format is quite interesting and I plan to dedicate a post. Okay, cool. Exceptions. 
Exceptions are quite complex beasts to implement since they break normal control flow. Jeez, that's weird. So they're both hard to program and hard to make. <laughs> Shocking. Shocking that crazy-ass control flow is hard to make. Uh, and might return early from a method and propagate on the call stack. I am pretty happy with the way I've implemented them, though, and I'm going to show you some of the re uh, relevant code. The first thing you need to know is that any catch block corresponds to an entry of the method's exception table. Each entry contains a range of covered program counters, the address for the first instruction in the catch block, the exception's class name, which the block catches. Oh, very interesting. So the signature call frame execute instructions as follows. Okay, because, yeah, that's right, because you can catch only specific kind of errors, so you may not, like, your first catch may not catch everything, so you may need to go to the next catch. Wild. Wild. Just absolutely wild. All right, this is great. This is great. Uh, and the standard Rust result type is this. Perfect. Thus, uh, let's see, executing an instruction can result in four possible states. The instruction was executed successfully, and the execution of the current method can continue. The, in, the instruction was executed successfully and its return instruction, thus the current method should uh, return with potentially a return value. Okay. Instruction uh, could not be executed because some internal VM error happened, or the instruction could not execute because the standard Java exception was thrown. The code that executes a method thus follows. All right, we got a call frame. Do this. Loop. Let instruction. Okay, there's our little program counter. New addresses. Uh... Let's see, let this thing, oh my goodness, VM error. Look at this beauty, look at that beauty. Instruction, new address, okay. Debug status, print instruction. Move the uh, program counter to the next instruction before executing it since we want to go to to override this. Absolutely. <laughs> go to would be like a break statement with a name, a continue, something like that. Because that's all those things are. They're just named go to's. Uh, instruction result. Self, uh, oh, I would do this. Instru okay, I, I mean, all this looks great. I'm sorry, or congratulations. Wait, is this Java without garbage collection? No, this is Java with garbage collection. It's just that the v the VM is written in Rust. It's actually how to get sued by Oracle and Rust Foundation at the same time. A menage a trois of lawyering. Uh, I know that there are quite a few implementation details in this code, but I hope it gives you an idea of how Rust result and pattern matching maps really well to the description behavior above. Yeah, it's good code, especially since he's only a few hundred lines into Rust. He must, this guy must be pretty familiar with pattern matching and stuff like that to go this far, this fast. All right, so this is the part that I'm really excited about right here. Garbage collection. The final milestone in RJVM has been implementing the garbage collector. The algorithm I have chosen is a stop the world, which is trivially follows from not having threads. Uh, let's see, semi-space uh, copying collector. I have implemented a poor variant of Cheney's algorithm, but I really should go and implement the real thing. The idea is to split the available memory into two parts, called semispaces. One will be active and used to allocate objects, and the other will be unused. When full, uh, when full, a garbage collection will be triggered. All of the alive objects will be copied into a, another semispace. Okay. Then all references to the objects will be updated so that they point to new copies. Holy cow. Expensive. Finally, the role of the two will be swapped, similar to how blue-green deployments work. Yep. GC root. So if you don't know, there's these objects called GC root objects. That's how you start the tree. And so there's like a bunch of them. And so it has to go through all of the roots and follow the tree everywhere. And once it finds everything that it can touch, then it's like, great. And so then those are the ones that stay. Copy pasta phase. Yep. See, there's this. Okay. Get them all in there. For references, boom. And then you can get rid of that. Swap roles. There you go. This algorithm has the following characteristic. Obviously, it wastes a lot of memory. Yep. Allocations are super fast. Bumping a pointer. Absolutely. Copying and compacting objects means it does not have to deal with memory fragmentation. Absolutely. So that's really good because memory fragmentation is super hard. Compacting objects can improve performance due to better cache line utilization. Okay. Real Java VMs are far more sophisticated algorithms, generally generational garbage collectors. Yep. Such as G1 or the parallel GC, which uh, uses evolutions of the copying strategy. Very cool. Yeah. Conclusions. Uh, writing RJVM, I learned a lot, and I have a lot of fun. I can't ask for more of a, from a side project, but maybe next time I'll pick something a bit less ambitious to learn new programming language. <laughs> I'm actually shocked. Honestly, can we all agree that the real W here is that you wrote a, an excessively complicated program in Rust after just maybe 1,000, 2,000 lines of code? Wow. Beautiful. Like, that's incredible. Well done. 
And aside, I want to say that I had a lot of fun with Rust. I think it's generally a great language as I have written, let's see, I've written before. I really enjoyed using it for implementing my JVM. If you're interested in further details, all right, go check it out. You'll have some more posts coming. I'll make sure I link this article. It is fantastic. Well done. Beautiful stuff. He uses Rust, by the way. His JVM uses Rust, by the way. The name is jar is actually just a zip file, a gen. <laughs>